something. And you can use boundary scan to modify what the chip sees without even touching the physical pin. So this is just something you need to be aware of if you hide pins by just not routing them. They might be accessible over boundary scan. Usually it's used for board level tests as, as I explained. So. And then there are a lot of implementation specific change and they are usually not documented at all. So uh, the, 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 each chip when there's free to do whatever he wants in the IR space because if he just uh, does not document those nobody will ever use them so they can use whatever they want and um, it's now interesting if we come across an implementation specific chain and we don't know what it is that we need to gain as much information as possible about it because it might be something a hacker could use to hack your system. Um, for example you should we will show later how we find out what change, uh, what change actually exists on a chip. So if you see that there's an implementation specific chain, you have a, a scan chain with some bits and you don't know what they're doing, um, you, you have to observe, you can observe them. For example, if the C a CPU boots up and configures different peripherals in the chip, you can see that, for example, if um, if some of the unknown bits in that scan chain toggle as soon as the CPU does initialize the memory controller or something, then you know that this bit is probably related to the memory controller or any other peripherals. Sometimes if you're lucky, you, you can act you actually own the code running on the device. For example, if it's your device, you can run code on it. You hopefully can run code on it. And you can try to match up the registers you see with what you see from the CPU because if you for example from the CPU see a register to configure the serial port and you change some bit there and you see on the JTAG chain the bit chain an unknown bit changes as well you might have found the JTAG way to access that functionality. And it's interesting because you can map the JTAG functionality to what you know or what you already know about the chip. Like if you already know about how you can exit this from the CPU side, you can figure out how to access it from the JTAG side and access, access it also on a system where you don't have control on from the CPU side. So the unimplemented instructions are usually implemented in one of those three ways. Uh, one common way is to just treat them as bypass so you just use this uh, one bit style which hasn't uh, functionality. This is one way how Im unimplemented instructions behave. Another way is that TDI and TDO are di connected directly without a delay or without a flip flop in between. Um, the problem with this is that the propagation delays of the chips add up and if you have a huge scan chain with several 10 chips or something, you get delays because the TDI has to enter each chip and leave each, each chip so you get a lot of, um, you, get, you get delays and you can't use your JTAG port as fast as you want. So that's why usually the, the, the bypass cell is used because it doesn't affect the timing except that you need one more clock cycle. Um, another way is that unimplemented instruction behave like TO is always connected to a zero. So there's no shift register anymore. You can shift as many bits into TDI but they will never come out of TDO. Um, so this is the third method how unimplemented instructions might be implemented. Um, Sometimes you can read back the instruction register and some bits will be modified when you read it back compared to what you have written in before and you will see that some bits might flip if the instruction was invalid or something so there's like status bits. You have to, to check your own chip and just play around with it and see what happens if you write that instructions, what comes out of the instruction register again and try to find a way to identify unimplemented instructions because you, your instruction space will be huge like 32 bit and you have to filter out all the unimplemented functions first and usually you, you will have much less uh, instructions after that so each scan chain and that's true for the instruction register and all of the addressable data registers has some distinct properties like it has a, a length like each register can have a different length from zero to whatever some several hundreds to thousand bits and each of those bits might have a distinct property in the sense that for example some bits are read write so you can scan in new data and it will survive if you read it out again. Some bits are like directly connected to some hardware functions and you cannot 
override them. Like they, are, they behave like a read-only bit, so they get updated to their hardware state every time you, you enter this, this capture IR state, which is part of the scan chain. And one important thing here is that even though we read the data into the shift registers in a serial way, the update is always atomic. So you read, you shift in the data, and all the bits change while shifting because they, you shift them in, and they won't get effective until you enter this update state, which is next to the scan state. So it's, they will get effective only after you leave the scan state. So you have an atomic update and atomic capture for all of the scan chains. So you don't need to worry about shifting in stuff too slow or something. Um, if you want to find out the length of a register, well, we assume that the register is already connected between TDI and TDO, so you always already went the uh, proper path in the state diagram. And the algorithm is simple. You just clock in a huge number of zeros, more than you think the size of the register will be, some several thousand maybe. And then you clock in a single one, and then you clock until you see that one appearing on TDO, because it propagates through the shift register until it reaches TDO. And this can be applied to both the instruction register as well as to any data register. So here's the example. So, oh yeah. So um, this might be the default content of the shift registers, some unknown values maybe. And you, you flood it with zeros, and then you shift in a single one, and then you record each bit coming out of TDO, and you're doing that sometimes, and the one propagates to the register, and at some point it reaches TDO. And then you know that the shift register is five bits long. So this, this is how you can determine the length of any unknown register. This is very important because when you have an unknown chip or a chip you want to find out more about the test modes, you should, the first thing you should do is to find out the instruction register length. So you apply the algorithm I just showed you why being in this, why walking the instruction register path in the state machine and you can find out the instruction register length. And then for each possible instruction register, you, do, you, you write that value into the instruction register and do the same length determining algorithm on the data register. So you can build a map of the, of the JTAG space this way. And then you should, if you have done that, you should find out more about the actual bits. Like if you see a register which is like four bits, you should try to figure out what those four bits actually are. So you might to, want to read them and see if, or to re rewrite them, to toggle them and see if they, their value changes. And some of, it's very much like registers in a, in a microcontroller where each bits have a, like a different property. Some are clear only, like you, can, you have to write a one to actually clear it to zero, like an interrupt status register or something. Some are read-write, some are read-only. Um, just experiment with the individual bits. And you, th there can be, I have some tools written for that that automatically try to determine as much as possible, but ultimately, you have to try it yourself by manually putting content into interesting registers and see what, it, what actually happens if you read them out. So um, now that we understand JTAG, we are actually in part three. We are under control of, um, yeah, we don't even know what it actually is. So here's an example. I've mapped a chip. I, I don't want to name it, but it really doesn't matter. It, this technique works on many, many chips. So I mapped some chip I had lying around and it had a five-bit instruction register. I found that out using the, the length algorithm. Um, it didn't have an ID code actually, which is interesting because most chips have that and that chip, it was the first chip actually I've seen that didn't have an ID code implemented. Um, you see here that the, the so the, there are 32, possible combinations, of course, for the instruction register. We th see that instruction 31, that's the one in the uh, bottom right, is a, has a length of one. So the number is the length of the actual register as found out by my algorithm. And the we expect the bypass register to be at the all one IR value, which is 31. And yeah, there it is. We see the bypass instruction at that location. And we see some more one-bit registers, I don't know really what they are. 